An amusing cartoon appeared in the New Yorker magazine this week. Take a look at this. It's quite interesting. And uh, you'll have a look at the illustration. And it's simply a, a group of guests who are on an aeroplane. And uh, they're somehow having an issue with the flight. It's quite a fascinating exchange. I think you will agree. Uh, but there's more to this particular characterization than meets the eye. Because you'll notice that within this message, and take a look at this, there's a guy at the front of the plane. He's got his hand in the air. And he says, these smug pilots have lost touch with regular passengers like us. Who thinks I should pl- fly the plane? Who thinks I should fly the plane? So you've got this idea that there's a passenger that thinks that he can fly the plane because he's had enough of smug pilots. Well, there you go. Pretty amusing stuff. Or is it? Because behind this humour is a message, a message that we've heard from the COVID zealots since day one. You're not a scientist. Show me your degree in epidemiology. I'd rather listen to a scientist than an actor, a journalist, a stand up comedian or an ordinary unqualified man or woman in the street. The message in that cartoon is one that we've had throughout the pandemic. Don't question, just obey. Stay at home, wear a mask, get the jab. Don't ask questions, stay in your lane and shut up. For two years, those who questioned the effectiveness of COVID measures and drew attention to their colossal damage, which is beyond debate, have been called dangerous. That's right, for the first time in history, it's now dangerous to question government policy. People kept awake at night worrying about the impact of COVID measures and doubtful of their efficacy have been called heartless, granny killers, and worst of all, right wing. Why is a concern about wrecking people's lives, economic damage, closed schools, and covering people's faces against their will, right wing? Why is worrying about a colossal non-COVID death toll, right wing? Well, it's not right wing, is it? It's just a way of putting you down of closing out the debate and shutting you up. It's the same way that a triple vaxxed person who defends the right for somebody not to have the vaccine, well, apparently they're an anti-vaxxer. Wow, you've had three jabs and you're an anti-vaxxer. How does that work? It's the same as the right-wing slur, the granny killer and all the rest of it. It's to put you down and to shut you up. Fear porn has played out on our TV screens in the course of the pandemic. Endless scenes from hospitals painting just one picture of the coronavirus pandemic. It turns out, according to official ONS data, 17 and a half thousand sad deaths were caused from or with COVID where there were no other comorbidities. 17 and a half thousand people over the course of almost two years. The average age of death over 80. Dreadful, appalling deaths, of course, and very sad for those involved. But that damning figure is on a par or lower than what we might see from a bad flu season. And we never locked down the country, closed once viable businesses and borrowed half a trillion quid for the flu. The truth is that it's not just ordinary people like you and me who have been silenced in the course of this pandemic and told to stay in our lane, to do what we're told and to shut up. Leading academics critical of these measures have been silenced too or they've silenced themselves, often for fear of attack, reputational damage, the loss of funding, and potentially the loss of their job. Which is why the voices supportive of these measures in the world of science have been particularly loud, creating the illusion of a consensus, creating the impression they are the science. Well, not really. They've just bullied everyone else, people like Professor Carl Hennigan of Oxford University, out of the way. Carl Hennigan is not stupid. Jay Bhattacharya, Martin Kuldorf, Sinetra Gupta. They're not stupid people, but they challenge the cosy COVID consensus. For that matter, I'm not stupid. And you're not stupid. The numbers are in. Just look at the graphs. Look at the countries that locked down hard and look at those that didn't. And states in America, show me the difference. And where's the evidence that masks made a blind bit of difference? The surgical and cloth masks, of which so many virtue signaling ideologues are fond, aren't even accepted in Austria 
or Germany, they don't accept them. Lockdown loving CNN's chief medical advisor said, do not wear a cloth mask. They are facial furniture. But if you wear one, you're a nice person, apparently. I'm so confused. Meanwhile, that prize numpty London Mayor Sadiq Khan has said he will continue the mask mandate on the tubes, even though it has been lifted by central government. London clearly an oasis of communism in an otherwise free country. Some universities and schools have said they will continue with mask mandates. How is that even legal? And the idea that the teaching unions give one fig about the welfare of children who suffer as a result of masks, but face scant threat from the virus itself, has now come and gone. They don't care about kids. Surely institutions continuing the mask mandate can't enforce them after Parliament scrapped them. High-profile medics continue to preach the mask ideology. So many people jumping on Twitter saying, I will continue to wear my mask. Now, a year ago, I famously chopped up a mask on national radio. Friends and colleagues told me at the time, it's not a hill to die on. It's only a mask. Well, it's now January 2022, and it turns out it was a hill to die on because some people want this to last forever. They want masks forever. They want social distancing forever. They want work from home orders forever. They want fear forever. They want control forever. That's why it matters. That's why it's all a hill to die on. Closed schools are a hill to die on. They should never have been closed in the first place. Masks are a hill to die on. Work from home orders, stopping healthy people from going to work and paying their bills. Getting people to stay at home on furlough and do nothing. Arrows in supermarkets. Those pathetic glass perspex screens. Endless hand sanitizer, which was debunked ages ago. It's all a hill to die on. Every single COVID measure you can think of has got to go. Lock, stock and barrel now. Vast portions of the media, brainwashed and fearful members of the public, bullying trade unions, partisan medics and scientists are all signed up to the cosy COVID consensus. None of them want this to end. They've now got an appetite for control and for compliance, and they don't want to give it up. But they're losing the battle. In my view, we have reached escape velocity, not from the virus, which will sadly be with us most likely forever, but from the hellish mechanisms which have caused so much human, economic and societal damage. So it's almost done. Future generations will look back at a disease with a survival rate of over 99 percent and have a simple question. What the hell were they thinking? But as long as we learn our lessons and finish the job and make sure this isn't repeated, then we can move forward with two words that must resonate the length and breadth of the country. Never again. I, like many, have doubtless paid a price for asking questions. Broadcasting as I have on the national airwaves in the course of the whole pandemic, hearing the human stories, your stories of suffering, mental torture, health problems and personal financial hell, it's been impossible for me not to ask questions. And I've lost friends in doing so, but clearly they weren't friends in the first place. So until this is over and until the needless human suffering stops, I won't shut up. I won't be quiet and I won't stay in my lane. And neither should you.